One of the interesting issues with regard to science and society in the modern era, in the 19th and the 20th centuries, in the West in particular, is the relationship between science and faith. This is an issue that's highly controversial, as you know. It's one of the discussion topics we featured for this semester. And it is a issue that will continue to spark controversy. So let's take a look at some of the elements of these controversial connections between science, the Enlightenment, and faith. Let's take a look at this. This is one of two parts video, because as you might imagine, this is a rather complex issue. So let's talk a little bit about the background and the buildup to the 19th century. We've already discussed this in other areas, in other um, content areas. So we've talked about the Renaissance and the Reformation. We've talked about how even in that time period, we were getting a change in the way that we look at faith, a change certainly in the way that we think about the world around us. So uh, the scientific revolution, of course, also an important element here. And we've talked about how this new approach to discerning knowledge, this new approach to fact finding, right, takes on a life of its own as we move into the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Uh, the Industrial Revolution comes along, and the Industrial Revolution shows how science can help us to develop technology that will change the world in which we live, change the work day, change so much of life as we know it. The Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, that period that we talked about as well, that, that tries to take the scientific method and apply it to the human condition, apply it to the way that people live their lives, live in community with one another. And as you can see, this particular element here really begins to speak to the idea of what's the role of religion in helping people to live in community, help people to live together, work out their ethical differences, their, their, their cultural differences. And the Enlightenment suggests, rather strongly, as we move into the 18th and 19th century, that just perhaps religion is not the only authority, maybe social science, can be an authority here as well. So you see the controversy developing. Copernicus, we've, you've seen in the videos on the scientific revolution that the Copernican approach, Copernicus's approach to the solar system, garnered some attention from religious leaders, not only the church, not only the Catholic church, but also Protestant leaders as well. We, ha we hear from Calvin, who is writing in the 16th century and his commentary on Genesis, uh, we indeed are not ignorant that the circuit of the heavens is finite and that the earth, like a little globe, is placed in the center. So Calvin, one of the great uh, leaders of the Reformation, weighing in on Copernicus here, that he's wrong. The earth is a little globe. It is placed in the center of the heavens and... This, the heavens are finite. They, they are most likely circular in na nature. Calvin's commentary on the Psalms, the heavens revolve daily and immense as is their fabric and inconceivable the rapidity of the revolutions. We experience no concussion. So, so fast is this motion that we don't, we don't really feel it. How could the earth hang suspended in the air were it not upheld by God's hand? By what means could it maintain itself unmoved while the heavens above are in constant rapid motion? Did not its divine maker fix and establish it? So again, Protestants concerned, if you will, about Copernicus sort of setting us um, into chaos with this theory. This is what that fellow, Copernicus, does, who wishes to turn the whole of astronomy upside down. Even in these things that are thrown into disorder, I believe the Holy Scriptures, for Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth. So Luther, looking to the Scripture, just as Calvin is, looking to the Scripture for authority, saying that the, the, the Aristotelian, the Ptolemaic uh, system is correct with a stationary earth and all the heavens revolving around it. 
in the 17th century, the church will weigh in. And in 1616, the Congregation of the Index issued a decree suspending de revolutionibus, the revolutions, until it could be corrected on the grounds of ensuring that Copernicanism, which, Copernicanism, excuse me, uh, which it described as a false Pythagorean doctrine and altogether contrary to the Holy Scripture, would not creep any further into the prejudice of Catholic truth. So again, just as the Protestant thinkers are concerned that Copernicus's ideas will create confusion, will somehow uh, set us wrong, the church comes out and says, after some study, and it's a good almost a century, right, after Copernicus first publishes his work, well, not quite a century, uh, that we're going to say, we've given it some time, the church has given it some time, and we've decided that um, this is false, it needs to be corrected. The, correction, the corrections that the church was after consisted largely of removing or altering wording that spoke of heliocentrism as a fact, rather than a hypothesis. And again, that, to many of us, I think, would seem reasonable, especially given the time and the date and the newness of this theory. In 1633, as you know, Galileo was convicted of grave suspicion of heresy for following the position of Copernicus, which is contrary to the true sense and authority of the Holy Scripture. He was placed under house arrest, and he was forbidden to teach or publish for the remainder of his life. So Galileo, on the heels of... Copernicus's work being indexed or put onto a, a, a list of books that ought not to be read until they're corrected, begins to publish, as you know, his version of uh, Copernicus, and he adds to it, right? He develops more. He adds to it. And in 1633, as you know, we have this very famous trial. Take a look at the selection from the Washington Post that I have for you, which will also uh, give you a little more information on that relationship between Galileo and the church, between, between Galileo and Pope Urban. And I think it gives you a, a, a rather, a pretty well-rounded approach to that controversy. Both Copernicus's work and Galileo's work, uh, the, the De Revolutionibus and then Galileo's dialogue concerning the two chief systems, were put on the index of prohibited books in the 17th century. Now, they are removed in 1835, so they are made uh, worthy to be read in 1835. Now, there are other folks who will take a look at the philosophy of Protestantism and the philosophy of science and come to the conclusion that Protestants and science, scientists in, in general shared some similar ideas. Both are anti-authoritarian of their day, right? We're going to challenge the authorities of our day. Calvinists rejected Catholic authority. The Copernicans rejected the Greeks. Uh, both ascribed to an ethic of performing good works, including the study of the natural world. Both Protestants and scientists believe that, that in studying the natural world, we can try to understand God's plan. Both exalted the power of an absolutely powerful God who maintained the order of the universe through natural laws. So lots of connections, if you will, between, let me back up, between Protestants and scientists in just their philosophy of looking at authority, looking at truth. Let's move on to this idea of the Industrial Revolution and let's think about, again, let's remind ourselves of the changes that science and, and technology are bringing to the world. In particular, changes on how we work, where we live, um, what family life is going to be like. We asked the question before, can we apply science to society? And as we said before, and this is a bit of a, re a review, the Industrial Revolution showed that uh, the practical application of science in mechanics and dynamics in particular was truly able to, sh to change our, wor our world and the way we live. Can we apply the scientific method to analyze the human condition, as we noted at the beginning? Just as scientists have identified and articulated laws of, of motion in nature, are there laws governing human nature? We also referenced Comte. Comte sort of considered the father of social science. Uh, he has suggested that human history has passed through many stages, and in particular, the theological or the or the the stage in which religion brings us 
the sor- is the source of our knowledge, to the metaphysical in which philosophy is a source of our knowledge, then to the positivist stage, if you will, where experimental science brings us a source of knowledge. Again, we've looked at this in other places. And remember that um, uh, when we talked about Darwin, remember that after the time period of Darwin, um, or just about the time of Darwin, we start to get the church engaged in really uh, challenging, if you will, that the scientific method is the only way, as Comte seems to suggest in his list, right, that, that experimental science is the only source of knowledge. The church will come and say, no, come on, that is not the only source of knowledge. Uh, you know this to be true. Uh, and so for them, they say it's an error to believe that the methods of the theological doctors in medieval university, the philosophers, um, are unsuitable for the demands of today. Even though the world is getting faster by train, uh, we are becoming more urban in our work, that uh, the, the, the scholars of philosophy, the scholars of theology can still help us deal with the demands of today. You'll remember that we had these debates between Anglican ministers and T.H. Huxley over Darwinism. And Huxley very famously said, traditional faith is incompatible with what we know of the natural world. He's one of these philosophers who's going to try to make this break. Extinguish theologians, he suggested. And it's a very dramatic quote. Lie about the crib of every infant science as the strangled snakes about that of Hercules. So sorry to, to bring that to you again if you, if you saw the other one. But again, trying to remind you of of the time period in which all of this is coming together. In the 19th century, it just really comes together. Uh, Darwin. Protestants do not support Darwin, right? Uh, if there's some place where, in the beginning at least, uh, most church leaders can agree is that Darwin is a new idea that is a theory, thank you very much, just as Copernicus was a theory, right? The Darwin... Darwin is, is, again, we're moving very fast in trying to understand the history of humans, the history of biology, and slow down a bit. Uh, again, so we have these debates between Anglicans and Darwin's supporters. Uh, Protestant thinkers just cannot support Darwin's theory of evolution. There's just not enough uh, at the time when it comes out for them to be able to get behind it. The other thing that's going on is, and again, and this is embedded in all of this discussion we're having here, is the Catholic Church's response to the Enlightenment. And there are two places we want to go. We want to go to Italy and we want to go to Germany. Italy, as the home of the papacy, certainly, the sort of center of Catholic thought, philosophy, geographically, and also to Germany. But let's start with Italy. In the 19th century, Italy was not yet a country. The French Revolution that had started in the late 18th century, moved into the 19th century, uh, created great havoc in Italy. Uh, some people in Italy supported the French Revolution, some did not. Napoleon actually comes in and invades and tries to lay claim, if you will, to the papacy. Uh, Ca France is a very Catholic nation, and one of the things that Napoleon needed was he needed the... Uh, papacy to come along with him, and this will be a very contentious issue. This will be warfare. Uh, there is no state of Italy in the 19th century, so there is no uh, distinct political leader of that entire region. Uh, the Pope is very popular, the Pope is very powerful in the area, but the Pope does not control all of Italy either. We're going to find that in this tumultuous time, politically, the Pope is going to be under fire. Um, again, from those people who might support Napoleon and his revolution and his empire building in Europe, which you, you may know that in the 19th century, Napoleon tries to conquer all of Europe. Uh, and so there will be some political leaders in Italy who support Napoleon, some who oppose him, and the papacy finds itself in a very difficult political position. At one point, the pope is under house arrest himself uh, because Napoleon doesn't actually want to take him over if you will, but uh, Napoleon wants to uh, uh, make sure that the papacy is somehow sort of on his side.
So the Pope and the Church are under some difficult times in the 19th century, and they see a lot of attacks, political attacks, philosophical attacks, on the status quo, on the role of religion in society. And so they start to work even more closely in uh, areas where uh, they think that they can have a significant, make a significant difference. And so matters such as marriage, family, and education. So the church is, uh, which it has always been in, but really attempts, the church really attempts to be part of this new society that's being developed in these, in, and tries to be engaged in that, and, and does so in this very fundamental fashion, marriage, family, and education. So we're going to see the church uh, founding and funding associations, sort of social associations, uh, associations that are community organizations, newspapers, Newspapers, uh, trying to communicate with people more effectively using this new technology of newspapers, schools, education, social establishments. You might think of the Knights of Columbus. You might think of uh, different kinds of community organizations and new religious orders. We find that in the 19th century, there's a significant growth in the number of religious orders that are, are very v vibrant in 19th century Europe. Other issues that are going to start to happen, there's going to be a lot of activity around, well, community events, community ritual, community activities. The church is going to, to encourage pilgrimages, the idea of individuals, families, groups, taking the time to make a pilgrimage to a site associated with a saint or a site associated with some um, great important event in, in church history, right? Uh, mass assemblies, so having more assemblies, more um, uh, community events. We're going to see more dedication to the devotion of the Virgin Mary. You may know that the 19th century, moving into the 20th century, is also a time when the roles of women are changing in society significantly. And one of the, uh, the, the idea of enhancing the devotion of the Virgin Mary is meant to remind women that they too are a vibrant part of the church, right? Uh, devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Again, uh, some suggest uh, this is a very vibrant way of, of connecting people to God, connecting people to Jesus. And uh, for example, the, the sisters that founded our university, right, the Adores of the Blood of Christ, you may know that their emblem is the Sacred Heart. Yeah. So there are lots of, uh, sorry, and that order was founded in the 19th century. Yeah. So uh, a lot of interesting developments in uh, church activities, spiritual activities such as these, and then also community activities as, as we discussed on the previous slide. So uh, community activities, associations, papers, schools, and then uh, spiritual activities as we see here. So again, uh, the church is not slow to respond to what they see as a changing view in Europe. And it's not just anti-science. It, it really isn't. It is a view of the world is changing fast. The world is changing quickly in this age of what some would say is sort of the first global era, right, uh, that we've seen with, with extraordinary communications and transportations brought on by the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution that the world is changing and it's changing quickly. It's changing not only in science and technology, but also in philosophy and in politics. Now, we're going to move forward further and we're going to get some very um, outspoken uh, popes as well. In 1832, we're going to start to see um, Pope Gregory the 16th come out to condemn what he's going to call liberalism and a free press. Liberalism was a philosophy of the 18th and 19th century that really advocated the freedom of the individual, the uh, freedom of the individual citizen in the political sense. right? And it also sort of elevated to an extent the uh, idea in the social contract, politically and legally, that a government ought not be able to uh, infringe upon the freedoms of an individual. 
So this is really sort of the Enlightenment writ further in that uh, the Enlightenment talks about, you know, dare to know, uh, challenge authority. And liberalism is one of those, those concepts. The origin of the term is freedom, liber. And so uh, this idea of elevating the individual above all, all else, right, was seen as a bad move as far as the church was concerned, because this meant that one could get rid of all other authorities, right? Uh, that, that, that This could go way too far. Again, some people do take this very far. Some people don't take it far at all. But uh, at any rate, this this concept of liberalism and freedom for the sake of freedom really, really was concerning to the church with regard to how to lead the flock, how to lead people, how to get them to understand the role of religion in society. Keep in mind, in 1835, we mentioned it before, uh, that Copernicus and Galileo are no longer on the index of forbidden books. So in the 19th century, we also see uh, the papacy turn back, if you will, some of these earlier condemnations of science. And in 1854, we get with Pope Pius IX, this idea of, a Mary, of Mary's Immaculate Conception. So we get the church defining uh, Mary's role within religion, Mary's role within the church. And we talked about how this is also a time of uh, enhanced devotion. In 1864, the Vatican publishes the Syllabus of Errors. And this is a very interesting work. There's a list of sort of wrong-headed ideas, if you will, errors. And one of them, number three, was very important uh, in, in the thought of the day. Human reason, individual reason, right? Liberalism, even, if you will. Human reason, without any reference whatsoever to God, is the sole arbiter of truth and falsehood and of good and of evil. This is an error, says the Vatican in the Syllabus of Errors, that human reason, without any reference whatsoever to God, is the, as the sole arbiter of truth and falsehood of good and evil, is an error. Number four, all the truths of religion proceed from the innate strength of human reason. Hence, reason is the ultimate standard by which man can and ought to arrive at the knowledge of all truths of every kind. We've seen before how social scientists are suggesting that the way to truth is solely through the scientific revolution. And the papacy is going to challenge this and say, nope, um, this, this derives not just from human reason, but from a connection to God and understanding God's role in truth. In 1870, the Vatican Council declared the dogma of papal infallibility. And you may know this, that when, and it's, it's rarely, rarely used, but the uh, concept is that when the, when the Pope is in the chair, right, when he makes pronouncements ex cathedra, from the chair, cathedra just means chair, the papal, the papal throne, that he is infallible. It's rarely used, but um, the, the doctrine, the dogma, excuse me, is announced in 1870. We have the first Vatican Council. You may know of, of Vatican II. That is the second one in the 20th century, the first Vatican Council. And one of the issues that comes from this is the role of divine revelation. Divine revelation comes from sacred scripture. Divine revelation comes from sacred tradition and the sacred magisterium. The magisterium is the, 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 the official teaching office, if you will. The Pope's teachings fit into the sacred magisterium and must be based in and not contradict sacred tradition or sacred scripture. So just as Comte had tried to define truth, if you will, uh, that, that it comes from the scientific method, and the, the papal response to this is going to be divine revelation, is not the result of human reason, but comes from sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the sacred magisterium. So again, 19th century, the church defining, if you will, uh, in, the, in this extraordinary age, its authority when it comes to discerning truth. 
when we start the second v 